Hello everyone and welcome to another international edition of Token City on Negocios Televisión. Today we have a very, very important guest. Her name is Emma Joyce. She is the executive officer at GDF, formerly known as Global Digital Finance. And um, here she is. Hi Emma, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on. Um, I would like you, please, if you could uh, start by explaining to our audience about your experience, how you joined GDF. Absolutely. Um, my experience is very traditional finance based. So I started off um, at Fidelity um, International, the um, fund management company. And then I moved over to City, the investment bank, um, where I was for many years. And I absolutely loved um, traditional finance. And that really is my background. It was at City that I started working on actually a very large event where we were looking and exploring digital money. And that sort of sparked my interest in digital finance. And I was very lucky then to move to GDF in its very early days, we were tiny, small membership organization, and I was head of community and I really helped to grow the organization, bring in new members, work with regulators and policymakers. Um, and then I think about two years ago, maybe longer actually, um, became the executive director and now I'm um, the CEO. So yeah, very lucky and uh, an incredible job. At Token City, we are familiar with GDF and your mission and what you do. Um, also, we will go into that, the merger with uh, the Global Blockchain Business Council. So maybe uh, if you could start by explaining what GDF, uh, how it uh, came to be, what it does, what it is. Absolutely. So it was formed um, approximately five years ago. It was... Obviously, we know there is a lack of regulatory clarity in the digital asset space. And it was really formed to try and provide some of that clarity. So we are now the leading global members association, really trying to accelerate the adoption of best practices for digital assets. And the way that we do that, we have a number of codes of conduct. And that's how we started. So we started putting together codes of conduct for the industry. We worked with our members on putting together these codes. So it's really, you know, where we have very, you know, professional, sensible members of the crypto community and now larger digital assets community coming in and saying, you know, we want, you know, with the lack of regulation, we are going to register against these codes and we are going to abide by this code of conduct and show that we are good players in this space. So I think, you know, we really try and encourage sound governance policies um, and the end result for us would be to enable the crypto asset market to thrive um, through these codes of conduct for the sector. Um, now, obviously, we are starting to enter um, and have been for the past few years, really, a, a phase in which regulators and policymakers are taking quite a lot of note of the industry and you know working with the industry to hopefully determine some sort of regulation that you know I know we're going to speak about shortly. Yeah, um, I mean just just uh, to point out a little bit uh, one thing that I that I think uh, uh, sorry there's something something here something that's remarkable about um, GDF the organization is how it brings together big and large institutions, uh, big institutions and, and, and small companies. I uh, just wanted to point that out because it's, uh, it's a, a great feature of the organization. So um, in the context of what you just explained about GDF, could you f tell us about the Global Blockchain Business Council, how you came to merge with this organization and why you did it? Absolutely. So Sandra Rowe is the CEO of GBBC, the Global Blockchain Business Council. And Sandra has actually been on the board of GDF for about three years. So we know Sandra very well. We'd worked with her for years. 
Um, we enjoyed working with her very much. She's absolutely brilliant and very well known um, in our space and industry. And we'd started to work a little bit with her team as well, especially during lockdown, we produced um, a weekly webinar with GBBC and it was quite a natural move for us actually. We have very you know, similar culture. I think we want the same thing. GBBC are very focused on education. So they're, they're very focused on really, you know, trying to educate policymakers, regulators, the general public on blockchain and also looking at what blockchain can do for good. You know, so where is the social impact of blockchain? They partner with the UN World, World Food Program Agency. Um, they are raising an awful lot of money to try and stop poverty and try and really help people um you know and find a way to end hunger so i think they're very you know they're really doing a lot of good in this space and it was a very easy partnership for us so we decided to merge we merged last may um it was very exciting you know we were very you know we were we were we have a lot of members um but we were been a small team and so now we're a much larger team we've more than doubled combined um the association now has um over 500 institutional members so we are now the world's largest um blockchain and digital asset um members organization by some way which is fantastic and i think you know as you say and rightly say we do have a real mix of membership and this is just continued with the merger with GBBC. So we have some very large institutions, we have banks, we have the big law firms, we also have a lot of startups. And that's also always been very important to us that we have startups in this space and capture that creativity. We have, you know, some of the big exchanges, we have lots of crypto native firms. So it's very important to us that we have all the different companies in the ecosystem within the community and we want everyone to come together it's a very collaborative space we have a lot of different working groups where we will have competitors often working together um, small large different companies and you know they're very focused depending on the working group on a particular topic and how it can benefit the industry awesome so <laughs> if i would like to know for you to explain to our audience um what are your plans going forward you uh so, uh, specifically also Sandra's as well, if you like, for the organization, yeah. in, in the, the okay. joint organization, yeah. Absolutely. Um, we're a members-led organization, so we go out to all of our members at the end of each year and we survey them. We also um, speak regularly to the regulators and we actually have a regulators-only forum that we hold quarterly, four times a year, and we survey those regulators as well. And so we know that our members' priorities going forward for this year very much um, are Europe. So we're very focused, particularly on the EU. Um, we have a focus on the US and we also have a focus on the UK. Um, we, you know, those are our real top three jurisdictions. And I think that's because really you can see what's going on in this space. And I know we will touch on it um, in a minute. But really our aims, you know, for this year and our plans are to focus on where we can help our members, where we can help regulators. We see it as our, you know, duty to educate regulators. We sit in the middle of industry and regulators. We try and bring them together. Um, ultimately, we want sensible regulation in the space, as do all of our members. And so we work with many different agencies and our members to try and achieve that. Understood. Um, you mentioned, yeah, your, your work with regulators. Um, maybe that's part of the, the achievements that, the, the, that might, have, might have been achieved in the, um, in the tokenization space. What, in your opinion, uh, are some milestones that have been achieved thus far um, in the space? I think it's been an incredibly exciting few years um, and I think this year, you know, whether, you know, it has been a difficult year for many companies in the space, but I really do think that this is a year of building. Um, we're seeing a lot happen in the regulation space. You know, in Europe, you've got the European Union's 
markets and crypto assets. So Mika regulation, that's due to come into force next year. That is really going to be the first attempt at a truly comprehensive regulation of cryptocurrency markets. And I think, you know, a lot of different jurisdictions, you know, are looking at that, particularly, you know, the UK um, going to be deciding what it's going to take from Mika and what it's not. Um, President Biden's executive order last year, you know, asking um, the agencies to really look at this industry and understand what's happening. Obviously, we're seeing, you know, a lot of enforcement um, happening in the US at the moment. And I think that will continue. You know, I'm sure that will continue. I know the, the SEC really have a focus on that this year. But I think, you know, it's will that lead to greater clarity in the US? Possibly. And it will be done through enforcement. And, um, you know, whether we think that's the right approach or not is a different matter. But, you know, we're, we've got the, we've got Mika in Europe. We've got, you know, the UK really trying to set itself up, I think, as a digital assets hub. Um, we've had a couple of consultations out in the UK looking at the digital pound. Um, and, you know, we also have that focus in the US as well as, you know, many different regulators around the world really exploring this topic a little bit more. So, you know, for me, Mika is a big milestone and I think, you know, when that comes into force next year, that's that's going to be huge. And we'll see the different jurisdictions and countries follow that. Completely agreed. Um, if I may add, we also have the pilot regime here in, in the European Union. We had a uh, principal economist at the commission, Joachim Schwerin, come on and, and talk to us a little bit about it. Since we have a little bit of time Emma, would you allow me to, to ask you another question? You mentioned um, regulation by enforcement. Um, can you explain to our audience what you mean by that? Because it's something that, you know, uh, maybe it's not such a term that we, we might be used, we used to. Uh, it seems to me, as I, as I, my understanding of it, is that um, the regulators in the U.S. are enforcing current laws, securities law, correct? Uh, yeah. In the space which is having some good or bad consequences depending on how, on how you look at it, right? Is that it? Yeah, I mean, look, I think the difficulty in this space, and we've had this for many years, is that there isn't clear regulation defined for the digital assets industry. So yes, you have you know, you have regulation for securities now. Obviously, there is a there is a debate about what falls under securities, um, and I think there are many companies in the U.S. that would like to see to have seen you know a clear framework set out um, on regulation for digital assets, but there isn't one as yet. Um, and I hope that we will get one. But obviously, we are seeing the SEC. Um, litigate against some companies that they feel have, you know, broken rules. And so what you are seeing is you are seeing companies accept that and pay fines and hopefully move on. Um, or we may see some companies possibly say, no, we don't think we did break that rule. And, and then it will go to court. And I think if in those instances, if there are court cases, it will be very interesting to see what happens. Um, but I absolutely look, to be clear, I, I have sympathy with both sides. I think industry needs clear regulation and it is looking to regulators and policymakers to provide that. But I do understand that on the other side, regulators and policymakers you know, are really in, in a quite difficult space because they don't want to be accused of stifling innovation. We must let companies, you know, be creative. And, you know, we want these, you know, this new industry to thrive. But at the same time, they are tasked with protecting consumers, particularly on the retail side. So it is striking that balance. And I'm really hopeful that when we have Mika, um, it will set a good hopefully it will set a good balance um, and a good example to other jurisdictions that they can maybe adopt parts of it or some of it or, you know, tailor their own framework to that. Does that make sense? 
Um, well, we are nearing the end of our uh, um, interview. Maybe there's something else that you'd like to add? Um, no, I mean, look, I think it's an incredibly exciting place at the moment. I think that, you know, obviously with the FTX scandal last year, I think that takes up a lot of the headlines. Um, most of the players in the space really want to do the right thing. You know, all of our members are looking for regulation. They're very engaged with regulators and policymakers at the moment um, in all different jurisdictions. And I think they're working with us and we're working, you know, with the right agencies to try and achieve that. Understood. Well, thank you so much, Emma. That was a pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. That was Emma Joyce, uh, Chief Executive Officer at Global Digital Finance. Thank you so much and take care. Bye-bye.